Okay, so we, we, by making a t-table, and this works for just about any function, right? T-tables are so handy. They allow us to plot some key points that allow us to kind of see what the shape of the function is, right? Sort of connect the dots in a way. It takes you back to those, those grade school days, right? Do connect in the dots. We ended up getting this result when we graphed this floor function, which makes sense. Floor functions, if we want to call them floor functions, or if we prefer to call them greatest integer functions, they mean the same thing, but they always end up looking like step functions, like an infinite staircase of some kind, right? And here's the staircase we got for this floor function, okay? Now let's find the domain in the range. Okay, and this is where I still think this is a new concept, and I still feel like this is a little bit People might be a little bit iffy on this idea of coming up with the domain in the range. So let's talk a little more about that, maybe fill in some gaps on that. So the domain, you tell me, write down in chat, the domain is the set of all the X or the Y values. Which one? Let me know in chat. Everybody needs to answer. Well, they can't see your screen if you're... Oh, you can't see my screen. Oh, well, let me get the screen up there. Thank you. Okay, you good? Everybody can see it now? Okay, good. So now let's, yeah, let's, let's, go, let's go back to that. Now that you can see the picture, let me, let me restate a couple of those things. So, so we were able to, to graph this floor function by using a t-table, by inputting some values over here, right, of, of x and calculating. When I input values of x, I was able to calculate what number goes inside the floor function and then take the floor of that, right, or the greatest integer of that. Remembering that the definition of a greatest integer function or a floor function is that the value that we're feeding the function, the output is going to be the greatest integer less than or equal to the input number, right? And so, for example, when we input a negative 4 for x, well, 1 half times negative 4 is negative 2 plus 2, gave us a value of 2. That was the number that was inside the floor function, and, and the floor of 2 is just 2, right? When we plugged a negative 3 in there, 1 half times negative 3 is negative 1.5, right? Negative 1.5 plus 4 gives us a number of 2.5 inside the floor function. Well, what's the greatest integer less than or equal to 2.5? 2. So we've got two points we could graph, negative 4, 2, and negative 3, 2. And then if we jump down to negative 2, 1 half times negative 2 is negative 1, plus 4 is 3. So that gives us a number 3 inside the greatest integer function or the floor function. The output would be a 3. So when we get to negative 2, it jumps us up to a, a y value of 3. Well, we just put in a value close, you know, just a little bit less than negative 2, just to make sure that the function was staying level there. And it is, of course. If I plug in negative 2.2 for x, one half, half of negative 2.2 is negative 1.1, plus 4 is 2.9, right? The greatest integer less than or equal to 2.9 is 2. So if I go over negative 2.2, just a little to the left of negative 2, I still have a y value of 2, which makes sense. We're still on that step, aren't we? We're on that horizontal step that I'm pointing at right there until we get up to x equals negative 2, and then we jump up, right? And then if I plug in negative 1, I end up getting uh, a, an output of 3. And when I get to 0, and with uh, one half times zero is just zero, so I get four inside my floor function. The greatest integer less than or equal to four is four, so it jumps us up to another step. So we can see the pattern here, right? Everybody good with that? How we got the pattern? Okay, now let's look at the domain. So the domain is the set of all the x values that are graphed, right? There's a couple ways we can sort of think about this, a couple models we could use to think about the domain. One way is think about, uh, we're just thinking about the set of all the x coordinates. And it's think about an ant walking along this infinite step function, right? What are the x values that an ant could step on? Are there any x values that are skipped? Well, there, there aren't, are there? The ant is walking along, like when he's walking along this step right here, he starts on that step at negative 4. 
he can hit every single possible x value until he gets up to negative 2. And when he steps on the x value of negative 2, that he's, he's stepping up to the next step, right? So he's got a place to stand for every x value. There are no gaps. There's no places that he can't stand on. And so that tells me that the domain is everything, right? It's all reals. Think about it in terms of of projections too. And I really want you to get used to this idea of projections because that, that's a really important math concept later on in mathematics. Do you really get the idea? When I talk about projecting a graph onto the x-axis, so we're graphing the domain, give me a one to five on that concept. How are you feeling about that? You know, I've, I've talked about that quite a bit, but I'm just not sure everybody's feeling awesome about that concept. Well, that's pretty good. Okay. Okay, let, let, let's hit it one more time. That's not bad. I mean, that's really pretty good, but let's hit it one more time here. So, so let's take, for example, let's take this step right there, and let's just take that, that one piece of our infinite piecewise function, our, stair, stair fun, our step function, and let's project that onto the x-axis. Projecting it onto the x-axis means that I'm going to keep the x-coordinates of the points the same right? But I'm just going to push them down, flatten them down. So their Y coordinates become zero. Like for example, let's look at this point. Let's look at this point right here. How about here's a point that we know, right? We can see, yeah, here's a point that we know that point has coordinates X equals negative four. y equals 2, right? Well, when I project that down onto the x-axis, the x-coordinate has to stay the same, right? So now when it goes down here, the x-coordinate needs to stay negative 4, but because we're pushing it onto the y-axis, the y-coordinate's just going to become 0, right? We're only focusing on the x-coordinates and graphing those on the x-axis, right? So you can think of it as like a projection is like a shadow. So if the sun were directly overhead and it were the rays of light were pointing straight down, the projection of that single point would be its shadow on the x-axis. And everybody can probably see that's going to be right there, isn't it? Right? I'm going to do that for all of the infinite points on that step. Well, let's pick the boundaries, right? We're going to have this solid left end point is going to project down to a solid endpoint right there. This open endpoint is going to project down to an open endpoint on the x-axis, right? And then every place, all the infinite points in between are just going to fill in that gap. So everybody see that that's the projection of that circled step? Okay, give me a one to five on that. I got to get some feedback, see how we're doing on this concept. Okay, good, good. That's getting better. So we're just going to do the same thing for all of these, right? So then I'll take the next step up here. If I take the next step and I project that down, well, now I've got this solid left endpoint that's going to come down and fill in what used to be an open endpoint. And I've got an open endpoint on the right. Whoops. And then we'll fill in everything in between. And if I keep doing that for all the steps, we can see what's going on, right? The closed endpoints are filling in the open endpoints and everything in between gets filled in. And so the, the, the total of all those steps when I add all of them up all infinite steps is just going to cover the entire x-axis right so then what's our domain all reals okay now what about the the range well the range is just the projection onto the y-axis right so now let's take something like how about if we take this point uh let's take this we'll take a different point let's take this point right here as an example. Actually, I'm going to take this one just because this gives us a little more room. Let's take that point right there as an example. Okay. If I'm going to project that point that has coordinates, uh, what's my x coordinate? Four 
and my y coordinate is 5. If I'm going to project that onto the y axis, the y coordinate needs to stay the same, right? So it's going to end up, it's going to get projected over to here, where it's got, if I look at the coordinates right there, its y coordinate is still 5. Its x coordinate, though, now just becomes 0 because we're squishing it onto the y axis. But we want to graph all of the y values, so the y coordinate needs to stay the same. Effectively, we're just casting a shadow, like there's a horizontally held light over here that's shining light horizontally, and it's casting a shadow onto the vertical axis, right? Well, what's going to happen if I take this point right there or that point right there? Where do they project to? Where do they project to? What do you think? Aiden, Swope, where do they project to? If I take all those other points up there, I took this one point right here, and it projected over to here. What happens if I take this end point right there, for example? Where is it going to get projected on the y-axis? Yeah, I, yeah, I was asking you, Aiden, where's, where's this end point going to go? If I, if I take this guy and project it over, push it over onto the y-axis, where does it end up? On the y-axis? Yeah. I don't know. Like this one right here, when I, when I projected this point over, it ended up right, whoops, why come that's not writing? Ended up right there. What about this point right here? Where does it end up when I project it over onto the y-axis? No idea. Okay, we'll, we'll move this on. Uh, Akira, what do you think? Where does it end up? Uh, would it be on the one side? It's, it's the, the right there, you mean? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be the same spot, isn't it, right? When I push this one over, when I stack it over onto the y-axis, it ends up at the same place. In fact, all of those points have the same y values, don't they? So they're all going to get squished over onto exactly the same point. And sure, I've got an open endpoint there at the end, so that one doesn't contribute, but all the other infinite points fill, it, fill that point in, don't they? You see where I'm going with this, you guys? So the projection of this top step just looks like that. Well, the projection of the next step down is going to end up right there, and all of those Y values on the next step down are all positive 3, so it ends up right there. All these points have y values of 2, so they all project there and so on. And if I keep going with that trend, you know, you can see what happens here, right? That's what our range ends up looking like, which makes sense, right? The ant is, he's stepping up, these, up this infinite step function, and he never has the in-between y values. He's always jumping up from one step to the next, right? So how could I say that range? If the domain was all reals, what's the range? If I look at those numbers, what if I fill in those, if I write those numbers in on the y-axis, what are they? Well, that's a y-value of 0, right? That's a y-value of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. Those are my y values. What's that look like? What do we call that set? Well, it's, it's going to be infinite for sure. But what do we call those specific numbers on there, right? Those are numbers that are positive and negative whole numbers. So they're not whole numbers because whole numbers aren't negative, but they're the positive and negative whole numbers. Yeah, they're integers, aren't they, right? They're not fractions, they're not decimals, they're just the dash marks on a number line, right? So that's what we mean by integers, okay? They're, they're, like, uh, they're like the fractions that have ones on the bottom, or they're decimals that don't need, that round, you know, they, they don't need a decimal. They round to an integer, right? That's what we mean by an integer. No decimals required, okay? So we could just write this then as... The range, we could write it as all integers. Or if we wanted to write that as a discrete set, we could do something like this.
What's the dot, dot, dot mean? That's called an ellipsis. It continues. Yeah, it just continues forever to the left and the right with that pattern. Okay? Everybody good with that? Give me one to five. Does that make sense? Either flash me fingers or let me know in chat. Okay. All right, so how do we do this using Desmos? Did I show you guys this the other day? I don't think I did, right? Not really. Okay, let's, let's yeah, let's look at this. So there's the function we want to graph in Desmos right there. Okay, so in Desmos, we call this a floor function. So I'm going to do f of x equals, and then if I want to get a list of the functions in Desmos, I can go down to this keyboard, and it gives me a bunch of options, right? I've got variables, I've got squared functions, I've got absolute values, square roots, and there's more functions over here if I hit this button. It opens up some other menus. So I can do trig functions. So later on when you're doing trig stuff, you know, SOHCAHTOA stuff, there's some trig function, there's some statistics functions, which we don't really use right now. Some distribution functions, ways, you know, we can, like we can write, we can make histograms and dot plots and box plots and all that kind of stuff. Or miscellaneous, there's a bunch of other possibilities. Like we can do other kinds of radicals other than square roots. We can do logs, you know, we can do, look at this, we can round, but we can do floor functions. Okay, that's what we're working with is a floor function, right? So you could just hit that button and it pops up as floor, or even easier, don't mess with that whole menu. Just type in floor and watch what happens. When I start typing letters, Desmos assumes they're variables until it recognizes I'm trying to say something. So as soon as I type the R, it knows, oh, okay, that's floor. That's something I know how to do. And it changes the font from a variable font to a regular, just regular font. So if I want to do a floor function then, uh, I'm going to do floor of, and then in parentheses, I'll put everything that's inside that, that greatest integer function or that floor function. So it's floor of one half X plus four. And look what it does. It shows me my step function there. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you want to add the endpoints, there's a couple ways you can do that, right? We could just go through and add some endpoints manually. Like I can see here, that it looks like I'm going by twos, doesn't it? It looks like zero, two, four, negative two, negative four. Those are all of the transition points, the endpoints, right? So I could just go in and, and, and set up some ordered pairs and I could do something like, for example, X is zero, Y comma, Y is whatever the function spits out when I plug in zero. So I'll just go F of zero. And yeah, look, it puts the endpoint on the left edge of that step, right? So that tells me that it looks like the closed endpoints are on the left. That's one thing I could do. That, that's fine. Or if I want to be really tricky, this is kind of a cool way to do this. I could go up to the floor function and I could change this by hitting the gear up here, which is that allows me to edit all the things that I'm graphing. If I hit the edit list, I have the option of converting that f of x that I defined, that function, to a table. So look what happens if I do that. If I hit convert to table, then it's going to plug in a whole bunch of x values and calculate the y values. And this is like a t-table, right? It's going to plot all those ordered pairs. Well, I don't need it to plot all these points. I need it to plot things like negative 10, negative 8, negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0. I want to plot the endpoints, which go by twos. So I can just delete these X values, go up to the top, and I could start at negative 10. That's my first one. And notice it, look what it does. It makes a little, it fills in a dot at negative 10. Then I can go down and do negative eight, and it creates another ordered pair at negative eight. 
And now the nice thing is, once I've done two of those, if it's a pattern, it recognizes the pattern. So I can think Look what it does. It fills in all of those endpoints for me. It, it plots all those points. That's pretty cool, right? You can do it that quickly, okay? So there's, there's how you can do this with Desmos. Here's a kind of a screenshot of what we just did, okay? How do you do it on a TI-84? So on a TI-84, the good news is it's the same for all of the calculators, So here's the TI-84. You just go to the Y equals menu to graph something. And then I need to, I need to find the floor function or the greatest integer function. So I'm going to go to the math screen to look for that math function. I'm going to scoot over from the math menu to the number menu. So hit the right arrow. And then it's the fifth option. Instead of calling it floor, they call it integer for greatest integer function. So we're going to choose five. I just push five and we want the greatest integer function calculated for what? Well, what's inside the parentheses, what's inside the greatest integer function is one half X plus four. So I'll just make that a decimal to make it easier. 0 0.5, 0 0.5 X plus four, close the parentheses. And then remember, instead of hitting graph, I reset the screen and go zoom six, zoom standard. And there it is. There's my, my floor function, my step function. And if I want to know where the endpoints are, I can check a couple of them by using that trace trick that I showed you, right? If I want to know where is the point at x equals zero, I can just go trace zero enter. And it tells me those are the coordinates of that function when x equals zero, y is four. And it shows me that it's, that endpoint is on the left edge of that step, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. I am going to let you folks work then. I'll be here. If you have questions, now's a great time to ask them. I'll just be available to answer questions. We can, you know, we can, yeah, you can share your screen with me if there's something you're not understanding, etc. So have at it. Use this time to get some questions answered.